um, assuming that all presenters are given access to um, to speak and have uh, or, or share their uh, screens. So um, the first paper is uh, protecting the private, no, the first paper on self-equivalence encodings in white box implementations. And it's authored by Adrian Renier and Bart Preneel. So I'm assuming Adrian will be presenting it. Go ahead. Yeah, can you see? Yeah. Thanks we for the see. introduction. So yeah, I will start. So traditionally in crypto, we assume that the endpoints of the communication are secure, but this is not the case in some real world scenarios. And the worst case scenario can be captured by the white box model that assumes that the adversary can, has full control of the device and can observe and modify any intermediate value at will. And the software implementation of existing block ciphers that aim to protect against this white box attacker are called white box implementation. In academia, mainly one method has been proposed with several variants that is the CU framework. Um, very shortly, the idea of a CU implementation is as follows. So first the cipher is decomposed into rounds, then in every round, one appends random permutation. These are called wrong encodings. And in order to preserve the functionality, the input encoding of the next round is chosen to cancel the previous output encoding. This is done for all the rounds except the first and the last encodings called the external encodings, they are not canceled. Um, while they make the implementation not functionally equivalent to the underlying cipher, they are needed for security. And finally, each round together with the encodings are implemented as networks of a small lookup tables in order to hide the wrong key material. Unfortunately, all white box, all C implementation have been broken. And while many of the attacks are specific to white box implementation of AES, a few generic attacks to the CEO framework have been published. And in this work, we first show that the best that these generic attacks can do is to reduce the wrong encodings to self-equivalence of the S-box layer. Self-equivalence is just a pair of a fine or linear permutation that when composed to, the, to a function, the same function is obtained. This reduction is always efficient, but no genetic analysis has been done on this type of encodings. And that is the topic of this work. So when, when one considers self-equivalence encodings, there is a more efficient, a simple way to derive a white box implementation that we formalize here as self-equivalence implementation. And the idea very, so, very shortly is as follow. So we first decompose the cipher into rounds and then the round into the S-box layer and the fine layer. In every round, we introduce a random self-equivalence of the S-box layer this doesn't change the input and output behavior. We do this for every round, but the first and the last encoding are chosen to be random affine permutation. And the, the, they are not cancer and they are needed for security. In this case, the key material is hidden in the encode affine layers that are given by the fine layers and the wrong encoding. And they are implemented as a single affine permutation. While CU implementation can always be reduced to self-equivalence implementation, the other way around is only possible if the self-equivalence of the s of ledger consists of the concatenation of a small affine permutation that we formalize here as diagonal self-equivalences. And in this work, we study for the first time when an s of ledger has non-diagonal self-equivalence. And we prove this theorem, a more generic version in the paper that says that in order to have non-diagonal self-equivalence, the S-box need to have additive self-equivalence and linear components. In other words, weak cryptographic properties. Thus, cipher with strong S-box layers like AAS, they don't have non-diagonal self-equivalence. And for this case, we can count and characterize the set of self-equivalence of, of the S-box layer. And finally, in this work, we propose the first generic attack to self equivalence implementation of cipher with a strong S-box layer, particular to SPN ciphers. 
or attack is a reduction attack based on finding a linear equivalence problems. And we propose two types of equivalence problems. The first one, the centralizer, reduce the security of a set equivalence implementation to the number of a fine permutation that are both self equivalence of the SBOS ledgers and commute with linear ledger blocks. While the second type, the asymmetric, reduce the security to the number of a fine permutation that are both right and left self equivalence of the SBOS ledger up to some linear ledger block. And what, what this attack shows is that the white box security of a self equivalence implementation highly depends on the properties of the software components. And here we show that, for example, for AS, the self equivalence of the S box and mixed columns allow to fully break a self equivalence implementation of AS. On the other hand, if a cipher has a linear layer and an S box layer that defines some very strong condition, then that cipher, that self equivalence implementation will resist this generic attack. Um, finally, what this and work shows is a very interesting line of research. That is the design of white box implementation of Cypher with weak run function. And that's more than five minutes, so I will stop here. Okay, uh, thank you so much. So uh, I don't think we have uh, any questions for now. Um, probably some will come up uh, during discussions. So um, we can move on to our next paper. Um, so I'm assuming it's Ashley. So the second paper is protecting the privacy of voters, new definitions or of ballot secrecy for e-voting. The paper is authored by Ashley Frazier and um, Elizabeth Squaglia. Um, here you go. Um, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so thank you for the introduction. Uh, I will give a brief overview of three new definitions of ballot secrecy that we have defined for this um, work. Okay. Uh, so ballot secrecy is intuitively the property that a voter's vote remains secret throughout the election, except when the result of the election reveals the vote. And to capture this formally, we consider an e-voting scheme in which voters register to vote and then obtain credentials from a registrar, submitting ballots linked to their credentials to a ballot box. The manager of a ballot box processes ballots and provides a public view of the ballot box known as the bulletin board. And eventually the tallyer computes and publishes the result of the election. Okay. So our three definitions consider three potential attack scenarios. Our first definition is set in the honest model. Um, so all election officials are honest, but the attacker can corrupt a subset of voters. In our second definition, we additionally consider a malicious ballot box. And then finally, we consider the case that the role of the tallyer is distributed. I, um I may uh, interrupt you. The slides are not um, are not progressing, so we just have a view of uh, your uh, front page or your front slide. Maybe you can un um, like unshare and reshare your screen. Yeah, I think I might need to do that. Okay. It's coming up a warning for me. That's why I was kind of yeah. hesitating mm -hmm. a little bit because I was like, "Is this showing now?" Yeah. I so think... can you see like a screen with a definition and then? No, now we see the screen with the, with the figures, like yes, the registered right, voters. Excellent. Yeah, that's working now. Yep. Okay, so sorry, I was just going through there. Um, no so kind of okay, ballot yeah. secrecy. Sorry? Yep. Uh, no what worries, I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. And um, then this is just really an e-voting scheme. Okay. So that's the free attack model. So just to kind of go back, first one is your honest model. Some voters are corrupt. Second one, the ballot box can be corrupted. And the third one, the tallyer is distributed and a subset are corrupt. Okay. So our definitions capture an indistinguishability notion, which was, uh, it was inspired by uh, Ben Alone Young's 86 definition of ballot secrecy. And it basically asks whether an attacker with access to an election result and the public bulletin board 
can distinguish two potential election views. So in the first, voter A votes one, voter B votes zero, and in the second, the votes are switched for the two voters. Okay. So formally, we capture this intuition in our first definition through an experiment in which the adversary can adaptively register and corrupt voters. And the adversary submits ballots on behalf of corrupt voters via an oracle cast and submits two potential votes on behalf of honest voters via an oracle vote. So eventually the contents of the ballot box are tallied, the result is returned to the adversary, and if the adversary can guess which election they're viewing, they win. Okay. So in this definition, uh, we define a balancing condition which must be satisfied. It requires that the left and right hand queries to Oracle vote are identical when they're viewed as multisets. And this is actually necessary to prevent trivial distinctions. Okay. So our definition captures re-voting policies and adaptive voter corruption. And this isn't captured by any of the preceding work in this area. Okay, so in the full version of this talk and in, and in our paper, we discuss how these features are achieved by carefully defining the balancing condition. Okay, then in our second definition, it builds upon our first, and so it captures this malicious ballot box. In the experiment, the adversary uh, constructs the ballot box themselves. They obtain ballots for honest voters via an oracle vote and they append ballots directly to the ballot box on behalf of corrupt voters. And in this case, the election result is always computed for the adversarially constructed ballot box. Okay, so here we have to define a modified balancing condition. It's a little bit different from our first one. It still allows for re-voting, but because of the modification, we only allow static corruption of voters, which we explain through example in our paper. That brings us to our final definition with a distributed tallier. And again, builds on previous definition. And we only require the following changes. We parameterize the experiment by N and T, and that's the total number of talliers and the number of talliers required to compute the result. The adversary selects T minus one talliers to corrupt and obtains their secret keys. And the election result is always computed using the T minus one keys requested by the adversary. Okay, so because this is quite similar to our previous definition, we obtain many of the same features. And this is actually the first game based definition to consider a malicious ballot box and a malicious subset of talliers. So it actually allows for security proofs that mirror real life assumptions, the fact that the tallier is often considered to be distributed and a subset of talliers can be corrupted. Okay. So just to summarize, um, we presented three new definitions of ballot secrecy. And in the full version of this talk, we also demonstrate that our definitions are satisfiable and that they can be applied to real implemented voting schemes. And finally, we compared our definitions with existing work and found that they provide advantages and model some new attack scenarios. So um, that concludes this short presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions and thank you for listening. Thank you, Ashley. So uh, I also don't think we have um, any questions posted on Zulu. So uh, so I guess we'll move for um, our next uh, presenter. So, um, yeah. So our next paper is algorithmic acceleration for BFV like somewhat homomorphic encryption for compute enabled RAM. And the paper is authored by Jonathan Takeche, Diane Rice, Ting Gong, Michael Niemeyer, Sharon Hu, and Tae Hu Zhang. And I'm assuming it will be presented by Jonathan. Yes, so, that's correct. Yeah. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. All right. So this paper is about using a special hardware paradigm of compute enabled RAM to accelerate somewhat homomorphic encryption and specifically about enabling some advanced algorithmic optimizations in this hardware paradigm. So first I'll talk a little bit about homomorphic encryption. Homomorphic encryption refers to public key crypto systems that can be used to perform computations over encrypted data. So it's a separation of knowledge and computation on some set of data. Somewhat homomorphic encryption is what's used most often in practice. 
um, because it avoids the overhead of having to refresh a ciphertext so that you can do a truly arbitrary amount of computation on that data. With somewhat homomorphic encryption, you can perform arbitrary computation over encrypted data, but you are limited by the multiplicative depth of your desired computation. One great disadvantage of homomorphic encryption is that the computational overhead is very high. The operands in these crypto schemes from the underlying mathematics are polynomials with thousands of coefficients, and each of these coefficients may be hundreds of bits wide. Ordinary CPUs are simply not designed for dealing with this kind of math. For example, you have CPUs that have only a limited number of registers, and each of these registers is limited to 32 or 64 bits. So because of these limitations, there's been a lot of research efforts, a lot in hardware and a lot in algorithms too. So homomorphic encryption has been implemented using hardware to optimize it, including FPGAs, GPUs, and ASICs. There have also been algorithmic optimizations published, such as the full RNS variant by Bajard and the number theoretic transform. So all of these hardware paradigms that we mentioned that research has been done in, along with CPUs, have a common weakness. They have an inherent separation between memory and processing. For example, in an ordinary memory hierarchy, there's a separation of where data is stored in RAM or in cache even, and where it's actually processed in the CPU. With the amount of data used in homomorphic encryption, this is a pretty serious problem. And a lot of prior research has been solely focused just around trying to reduce the latency required from data movement. The key idea for the collaboration between the hardware and cryptography groups at Notre Dame was to try and apply some special hardware that doesn't have this weakness to accelerate homomorphic encryption. And it turns out that the hardware that our nanotech collaborators are working on is a perfect candidate. This hardware is com called Compute Enabled RAM, or CRAM for short, and it integrates uh, processing elements directly into memory banks at a level three cache. So in this work, we had to work within some limitations of CRAM, which is not a fully mature technology yet. In particular, we don't always have all the benefits we would like when we choose parameters more generally the way a CPU library might. So the first part of this work was to formulate parameter selection to enable the advanced algorithmic optimizations of the residue number system, which allows you to break down large numbers into smaller tuples of numbers and the number theory transform, which allows faster polynomial multiplication. So those were the optimizations that we chose parameters specially to allow us to realize this in CRAM for the BFV homomorphic encryption scheme. We also noticed that in the context of the BFV scheme in its RNS variant, that we have additional special optimizations based on our parameter choices. So we implemented with a simulation and uh, did a thorough experimental evaluation of our work. Uh, we are limited to simulation because actually fabricating a usable CRAM chip would take millions of dollars and several years or so I'm told. So the main contribution of our work is that this is the first work to apply these advanced algorithmic optimizations to homomorphic encryption using the CRAM hardware paradigm. So some of our previous work in this used CRAM to implement a unoptimized version of the BFE scheme. So the textbook BFE scheme straight out of their paper. And we showed that you can have significant improvements just from the hardware alone. Now in this work, we showed that you have even greater improvements when you implement these algorithmic optimizations as you might expect. So we show improvements of over 700 times against a CPU research server using Microsoft, the Microsoft SEAL homomorphic encryption library. We showed an improvement of over 500 times against our previous CRAM work, which already improved on related work. And we show improvements of over 60 times and 30 times over state-of-the-art implementations of the BFE scheme using FPGAs and GPUs. That summarizes our work. Uh, that's the end of the short talk. The next three slides are just references, so I'm happy to take any questions now.
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Um, I think uh, let's look at the. We also don't have uh, still any questions, and we're uh, running uh, uh, somehow uh, late. So um, thank you so much, and uh, uh, wait for the discussion uh, in case any questions arise. We we'll move to our last uh, uh, paper. So our um, uh, the last presentation is. Uh, titled Towards Post-Quantum Security for Signals Extended uh, Triple DH Handshake. And the paper is authored by Jacqueline Brando, Mark Fishlin, Felix Gunter, Christian Jensen, and Douglas Tebla. Um, Jacqueline, go ahead. Yep, can you see my slides in full screen? Yeah. That's great. So hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Sia, for the introduction. Um, since we're already running short on time, I think let's uh, start from the end with the conclusion. Um, so the most important stuff is said. Um, this work started from the realization that post-quantum key encapsulation mechanisms cannot serve as a drop-in replacement in all real-world protocol designs. An example of this that we'll be treating in our paper is the initial key agreement in the signal protocol which is an end-to-end -end encrypted messaging protocol and the initial key agreement is called X3DH or extended triple Dipsy Hellman. To remedy this situation, we came up with a notion which we call split chem notion, um, which captures many post-quantum chem designs and actually serves as a drop-in replacement for the Diffie Hellman in the signal initial key agreement. And the notion is based on the observation that encapsulation often actually consists of first doing a key generation on the encapsulator side and then the actual encapsulation. However, I already have to say that we were not able to give a sufficiently secure instantiation of this notion based on any post-quantum hardness assumption. We do, however, note that c side based solutions uh, look promising, but they need further work in the sense that um, we found that the intractability arguments for Diffie-Hellman style interactive hardness assumptions that we have in key exchange, such as PRF or DH or strong DH are not quite clear in the seaside setting and therefore we don't uh, want to assume that this is the case, um, that seaside is strong enough in this fashion. Okay, so let's start. Today's protocols are based on Diffie-Hellman um, you can see here, there's basically two types of um, schemes, ones that are signed Diffie-Hellman and others are implicitly authenticated Diffie-Hellman protocols. And um, the signal protocol that we look at in our paper is implicitly authenticated Diffie-Hellman. But as we all know, Diffie-Hellman is not secure against quantum adversaries. So we need to replace the Diffie-Hellman operations in these protocols with something that is post-quantum secure. And for many of these, there's already some proposals where it seems to work quite well. But as we'll see uh, in a bit for um, Signal, it does not work. Um, now a bit on the differences between Diffie-Hellman and CHEMS. So uh, to quote my co-author uh, from one of his slides, Diffie-Hellman is just too awesome. So we have key reuse, we have very flexible message flows, and the same cryptographic object can be used for different purposes. So for example, also to achieve authentication. Key encapsulation mechanisms on the other side, especially in their post-quantum uh, setting, are not secure against key reuse in their basic form. So what the submissions to the post-quantum standardization of NIST, for example, do is um, they use a generic transform, the FO transform, um, to make them secure against key reuse. And a static static key agreement is usually um, quite problematic in this um, in this syntax because it's just not not thought of um, to be used that way. So the conclusion from this is that the direct replacement, uh, taking a cam and putting it where a Diffie Hellman was, fails in certain use cases, and this is the case in the Signal protocol. So uh, Signal, as I said, is messaging um, most 
uh, in particular asynchronous messaging. That means if Alice wants to start an encrypted communication with Bob, then um, she wants to do this even if Bob is online. Therefore, we only have uh, one uh, key. So basically one um, message passed from Alice to Bob. So we don't need Bob to be online to do this initial key agreement. And in Signal, the parties have a bunch of keys um, which have different um, lifespan, so from very long-term keys to semi-static keys and keys that are just used a single time. And basically the key that um, is derived to encrypt the messages is the concatenation of four Diffie-Hellman values that take together uh, a bunch of keys from uh, Alice and a bunch of keys from Bob's side, basically. And now if we look at where can we just replace this Diffie-Hellman with this encapsulation um, operation of a chem, then for K2 to K4, this works perfectly fine. But for this first K1, we have a problem. So this is a Diffie-Hellman, which is called static-static. So it involves a static key from Alice's side and a semi-static key from Bob's side. And this is needed um, for implicit authentication. So we actually would need an NCAPS under Alice's long-term key, but only Bob could be doing this NCAPS, which would mean that Bob would have to be online and send over a ciphertext to Alice and we would lose the key feature of this asynchronicity. So this does not work basically. And this is where our split chem notion came into play, where we, as I already said, um, observed simply that the NCAPS operation often is a key gen and then the actual encapsulation and lots of post-quantum CAMs actually achieve such a notion. Um, so if we look at, this is the CAM flow, I, I promise you there's more details in the longer talk, but if we look at then the encapsulation, then what happens usually is um, that there is first a key generation and then there is this um, actual encapsulation, which in the split cam setting we then call S encaps to distinguish um, from the normal encapsulation. And if we take split cam, so if we replace all Diffie Hellman's with this S encaps, then actually ex everything works perfectly fine because this problematic first key can also be, um, be done. And we are still asynchronous and we have the implicit authentication, so everything's great actually. But as I already said, um, we were not able to have this a strong security notion of both sided key reuse um, with active adversaries in the post quantum setting, um, which may be um, achievable by C site based solutions. That's it. Um, thank you very much. The paper is available on ePrint, and you can also check out the long version. I promise it makes much more sense. And I'm happy to take your questions then. You're welcome. Thank you, Jacqueline. So, still we have nothing on Zulip. So, uh, you may um, um, stay for a while and uh, monitor if we have something. Sure. Thank you so much. Bye. So, I think this concludes our uh, session for today. We still have some time for uh, discussions with the speakers. So, let's follow the Zulip for now. If we have something, um, we can take it on uh, Zoom. Otherwise, um, see you in the next session. Thank you so much. Bye. <laughs>